Welcome back to Charmed Reviews, home of manic episodes. Hope you enjoy the presentation. I miss this. Sleepless nights and endless exposition? Not me. For reals, dudes, thanks for being patient. I realize these reviews take a long time to get out, and personal life got in the way, as well as the need to take a short break and recharge. Stupidly, I thought, eh, this season wasn't as bad as the last one. I just know the review will be shorter. <laughs> Idiot. Before we get started, I should probably address the most recent news in the Charmed fandom. Charmedom? The Charmed Remake! Fans are aghast, the stars are furious, hellfire has rained down upon the masses, is nothing sacred anymore! Yet yeah, no. I hate to break it to you guys, but news like this comes around after a lot of popular shows are taken off the air. I remember for a long time there was talk about a Buffy reboot, as well as several imaginary spin-offs thrown into the gossip tubes. In fact, there was talk about charm spin-offs too back in the day, none of which came to fruition. I am sad to say that there was a hardcore fan base who desperately wanted a Chris spin-off. Your guess is as good as mine. But the point is, projects like this rarely take off. All we know about the reboot is that CBS has ordered a script for a pilot, and that's it. Unless they actually start making anything, I wouldn't put too much faith in it. But hey, I've been wrong before. In the meantime, let's talk about the original atrocity. The last season ended with Phoebe still powerless due to her own dumbassery and the show not knowing what else to do, and that hasn't changed yet. So I guess if there's a demon that needs to be vanquished using a Power of 3 spell, everyone is SOL. But don't worry, having a Power of 3 spell required still makes perfect sense. Let's take things slow with the first episode, alright? I've had a long summer, so I need to gently ease into this before covering the truly- Good God, people! This was really the season opener! Ugh, jeez, okay. Leo and Piper get guilted into going into a wedding because Phoebe and Paige want them out of the house. Piper is resistant because this involves people they know. This isn't about me or my children, what the hell? Through convoluted means that'll be explained in a hot minute, she and Leo receive the powers of Hindu gods. As Charmed's proven time and time again, they are sensitive to other cultures' religion and cannot possibly do anything offensive with this. As you might have guessed seeing that little preview I threw at you, this is mostly an excuse for juvenile jokes about Piper and Leo wanting to have sex and to have wacky things happen with Piper's stupid multiple arms. This is executed in various degrees of horrible. I mean, look at this. Is this what we've come to, Charmed? Look at the green screen on the arms. Sometimes it's just a couple poor extras behind Holly Marie Combs puppeteering her in what is sure to be the low point of their careers. Ugh, the CGI's worse. Sometimes the arms go super skinny, or she just goes through them completely. You go over there, you over here. Over here. Lord have mercy. Leo has a stupid Pinocchio outfit on, too. I don't care if it's traditional Indian garb or whatever. So, because they have Hindu god powers, they immediately found Indian clothes in their closets? Or are these magical Indian god clothes? Maybe they borrowed them from Phoebe's Horrible Outfits of the World collection. But they have to have something at stake here, so here's what's going on. If Piper and Leo have sex, they will end the universe! Buffy, at least wait until the comics for this kind of shit. Shakti and Shiva are commonly invoked at weddings because they're considered to be the ultimate lovers. Well. I'm thinking that's meant to be symbolic. Unless there are magical lovers to hijack. So two magical people have never been to a Hindu wedding before? And what powers did they get exactly? Piper gets the freaky arms and I guess the lightning thing, but what did Leo get? Magical potency? Was it just the same as his elder powers, but more powerful? <laughs> I'd just like to point out that several people had to write, act, direct, light, compose music, do stunts, composite several green screen shots, and add in stupid lightning effects and CGI arms, all to create this scene. Thousands of dollars went into this 30 seconds of screen time, but none of it could pay for the minutes you can't get back in your life. If it didn't seem clear by the opening here, we're watching a parody of a show at this point. Joke's on us, Charmed. It's the most elaborate prank in television history. We thought we were watching a TV series, but little did we know the plans they had for us. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Now that Gideon is dead, magic school is being shut down. Apparently, no one in the entire magical community was fighting for it to stay open. This is the only show I know of where apathy is a constant threat. No one cared about the education of their children. Imagine if in Harry Potter, Snape killed Dumbledore and then they were like, Weep! 
Oh well, guess we're shutting this shithole down. Magic school was a noble experiment, but I'm afraid it's run its course. An experiment? If I may quote the amazingly detailed Charmed Wiki, Magic School is an institution of magic created by the Council of Elders thousands of years ago, after untrained magic destroyed Atlantis. I don't know about any of the Atlantis stuff, but did they normally experiment for thousands of years? Magic School has a real practical purpose. It'd be stupid to shut it down. I'll fight for it. Against the Elders? You don't stand a chance. No offense, but Gideon was the only one that could stand up to them and convince them he could keep it safe from demons discovering us or, or mortals for that matter. Not that I'm supporting the Elders, but look, this is the Charmed Ones. They couldn't keep bread safe from the toaster. But why are the Elders so against education anyway? Isn't not having the school more of a liability? They'd rather have magical kids out in the real world? Doing things like, oh, I don't know, just to make something up off the top of my head. Conjuring up deadly dragons to destroy the city? And if not Paige, why not just send another elder to take charge? Do they have no one competent up there? Wait, okay, yeah, touche charmed. Now that Paige has stepped up, she becomes the headmistress of the school. Headmistress Paige. Hey, did you know that you don't need any education or experience to become a magical teacher? You need more training to teach preschoolers not to eat Play-Doh than you do to run a school full of teens that can blow shit up and conjure evil decapitating horsemen. And why not have someone who magically created a sex toy boyfriend head the whole school? Okay, maybe that reference was too old and I'm being unfair. But smoke on this pipe! In the same episode Paige said she'd fight for magic school, she also said, eh, fuck it, to personal gain while changing a dirty diaper with magic. That isn't something anyone with powers needs to learn. Personal gain? Do you want to lose your powers like Phoebe did? What if a demon attacks? Could liven things up around here. Uh, 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 personal gain. I know, but screw it. Technically speaking, since Gideon turned out to be evil, the safety was never guaranteed. But why are they worried about protecting these kids anyway, when we've established that no one can die there due to a protection spell? Not that I'd really qualify this dude as a kid, unless this school goes from grades K to midlife crisis. But they keep bitching that because the students are untrained, the school is dangerous to keep open. Hmm, if only there were a school that could perhaps help with that. A magic school. Double bubble, rip off in trouble, something plagiarizey this way comes. In case there was anyone else in the audience who might not have caught on to the Hogwarts overtones here, we've got teachers from the magical community as well to make it even more obvious, including a curmudgeonly gnome. Harry Potter! Filled with juvenile delinquents. In one of the show's more surreal moments, they shoot the gnome to death. L-O-L. Last season, Phoebe went on a vision quest at Magic School and gave the audience a glimpse of the future, which told us that Paige was going to become the headmaster of Magic School. This was clearly a planned trajectory for her character. That's because characters need to grow and evolve and pfft, yeah right guys, this is charmed. They just went, geez, this is boring, and kicked her out of Magic School way before this could have possibly happened in that timeline. I love that the vision really meant nothing in retrospect, which means that either Phoebe knowing what would happen changed events, or the vision was just a bunch of bullshit in the first place. This is all part of Charm's love of pointless drama. The writers really had no clue what to do with Paige in this role, which is why most of her magic stuff happens off screen or in tiny subplots. This can be said for all of Paige's story arcs, if I'm honest. No one has any idea what to do with her character. But truly, the best part of the Magic School storyline is how they write themselves out of it. What, you want me to clean Magic School? No. We want you to run it. Huh? What's going on here? Well, we were just thinking, since you're dying to try something new... And Leo being the perfect man for the job, considering your magic know-how, you're practically a walking book of shadows. Paige. I'm good. They didn't even tell her. They just appointed Leo Headmaster behind her back. How did they even have that kind of authority? Like, imagine this scenario. Hey, Phoebe, we decided you needed a career change, so the column is called Ask Leo now. What? We've already got everything switched over. Get out. No one does this to the great Phoebe one. Misogyny! All loose ends seem to be closed. Who needs forethought anyway? Now Paige can be a full-time white lighter. Oh, boy! 
The Elder starts sending her messages in her head to help charges, against her will, I might add, which once again raises many, many questions for me. This means she has to do the duties of a Charmed One and a White Lighter at the same time, not to mention she can't heal at this point, so... she can't even really do the one good thing the White Lighters are for. Good news, pal! You've got a White Lighter with only half the powers! Plus, she wants nothing to do with this job! Oh, and she can't heal you, and we won't send in anyone else! Hope you don't get injured when demons are trying to kill you! Oh, fuck! Yeah, I don't think she wants to hear the call. Ever. Well, that's impossible. She doesn't have a choice. Yeah, every other White Lighter has a choice, but half White Lighters are fucked! Charmed is making even less sense than usual. I mean, really. It wasn't Paige's choice to become a White Lighter. Not to mention she's one of the Charmed Ones, and she's supposed to have a White Lighter too, so... They need a White Lighter for a White Lighter? Isn't sending her needlessly into danger counterproductive to the whole shared destiny they have? Look, they fudged up the Prue thing, but they don't have any more backup sisters in case another one bites it. And all of a sudden, White Lighters not only protect witches, but they also protect future White Lighters. Which is part of what I thought witches did. Protect innocence? That was the plot for a while, yes? I mean, that makes witches kind of pointless too, doesn't it? Who was the future White Lighter I was supposed to save? You were. So she's not a White Lighter now? What? After this revelation of Pages, where she comes to accept her fate as the Elder's bitch, the very next episode she decides she hates it again. They're talking about her being assigned a charge, but wasn't she assigned a charge way back in Season 5? And it was her dad? Mysteriously risen from the dead? Also unwillingly a White Lighter? Man, the Elders really are penises, huh? On one of Pages' White Lighter misadventures, she meets a potential White Lighter with super speed. Wait, I thought the sisters each had unique powers because they were the Charmed Ones. If all witches have a special power, then what makes theirs Charmed One powers, and why are they so damn special? Is this like when Superman just puts super in front of whatever power he has to make it sound better? I've got Charmed One column writing powers. <coughs> Paige is the most inconsistent character on the show. Her personality really depends on what episode you're watching. Who do you think teaches me to be a white lighter? Me? I know I spent half the season running a fucking school, but what? Teaching? Preposterous! And speaking of inconsistencies, Paige orbs Phoebe away to the house without touching her. She can do that now? This is really useful. In fact, it's probably too useful. But now that it's been introduced, every time she doesn't orb someone out of danger when she very easily can, means she's either negligent or stupid. Keep the rules about your magic consistent, guys. They continually introduce very useful things which aren't used for anything remotely of the sort. When Phoebe has an interview and can't make it due to fighting evil, I know, I was shocked she didn't blow off fighting evil too. Paige glamours herself to look like her and do the interview instead. They have the ability to make themselves look like other people, and Paige so far has only used it to frame a woman once and to cover for Phoebe here. They don't even bother mentioning personal gain this time around. Or how about this one? Phoebe's powers evolve so she can share her visions with people. What happened to the things in the visions affecting Phoebe that they toyed with for like 15 minutes? Well, that didn't work. Time for some retconning! But now that Phoebe can share her visions, does she use this new power? Um, no, not really. Once. And if she can share her premonitions now, why do she and Piper switch powers so Piper can see one of her visions? What's that? In the distance? The sound of sirens. Could it be... The Fashion Police? Oh girl, you're not getting off this season. Let's look at this year's terrible Phoebe fashion. We have the Pink Ruffle Nightmare, and coming up behind that is a plaid jacket plus Shirley Temple do, ill-advised. Then the towel jacket, perhaps to dry off after a long, sweat-inducing day of ignoring innocence. Don't get too cold, though. Moving on to whatever the hell this sweater-slash-sleeveless combo is, let's change into this lovely poop-colored shirt. Now it's time to go to Grandma's. And last but not least, let's do some sailing in this odd puffball midriff shirt. Ah, is that the smell of the salty ocean air or Phoebe's loser stank? If you can't tell the difference, neither will we. The most surprising part about this season is actually how little it focuses on Phoebe. It's also part of why this season isn't nearly as obnoxious as the last one. Now, that isn't to say there isn't an abundance of Phoebe stupid happening here, but if you compare the Phoebe versus the rest of the world ratio to the last few seasons, there's a stunning difference. But fear not, for Phoebe is in top form. She is still the same self-centered a-hole we've come to know and hate.
She continues to have completely upside-down priorities and the inability to see past her own agenda. For instance, history as we know it is about to, and actually does, change through the course of an episode. What is Phoebe's focus? She's mad because a waiter didn't let Piper breastfeed in public. Look, Phoebe, we all know Piper is secretly secreting a poison anyway. She doesn't need this kind of publicity. I think the demon did something to that elder, got him to free up his repressed anger somehow. Oh, probably wasn't breastfed as a child. The universe is going to end because of the aforementioned wild and wacky butchering of a culture episode, and you can probably figure out how Phoebe responds. Where are you going? I have to go to, you know, work. The universe is going to end! The show seems to be briefly flirting with the idea of having Phoebe care about doing the right thing, and for a while, I was fooled. It seemed like maybe the writers had caught wind of the fact that Phoebe stank like yesterday's sewage and were trying to salvage her character. What we're all about is keeping you alive. Not at the expense of an innocent. Why are you not listening to me? I'm trying to save you. Because this isn't just about me. Look, I don't want to die, but I'm not going to sit around and wait for an innocent to die either. And I think that's why I needed to take that sabbatical. To remind myself of that. Well, hey now, she's back on track. She's caring about other people, not focusing on work all the time. She's even willing to die to save someone else. This is the perfect opportunity to humble her and get the show back to its roots. But actually, this was only written in because they had no choice. This episode was leading to Phoebe getting her power of premonition back, which she could only do if she proved to the Council of Big Heads that she could do the right thing. Literally, the writers had no other option than to make up some reason as to why Phoebe isn't the most horrible person in the universe. Because what happens once she gets her power back? Take a wild guess. I can't go anyway. I have to go to work. I'm stressed. It's my first week back at work, and I have a lot of catching up to do. And I'm going to help you with that, but first I have to deal with my column. Our sister is missing. And there are 50 jobs on the line if the paper does not come out. Well, I'm glad to know the future of magic is in such good hands. Just shut up, shut up, shut up! It's worth noting that half of those examples involve potentially world-ending consequences. That last one involves Piper and Leo trapped in the manor with demons, which Phoebe knows because she and Paige have been kicked out of the house by said demons, but she goes to work anyway. Also, good to know there's cell phone reception in the underworld. Also, why is Phoebe answering work calls in the underworld? Yeah, well, you know what? I'm not saving another innocent until I find out what happened. Innocents don't have powers. If they did, they wouldn't need us. We can't bail them out. Heroes have to be heroes. I read a lot. Yeah, I know you do. Maybe you should get out a little more. Piper, you idiot! Heroes have to go to work all the time and get facials when danger is afoot. I'm sorry, I was possessed by a good person for the sake of a joke. Actually, I'm not sorry. <laughs> when Piper is told she can't breastfeed at that restaurant, look at Wyatt, he looks bored as shit. Phoebe decides this is the perfect time to make a statement. So, of course, she rides in naked on a horse like Lady Godiva. Piper would have just killed them and played in their entrails. And why did she have to do her hair like a diva to do the horse riding thing? For the shitty promo that photoshops her into some sort of Siamese twin centaur? The one that says completely deceitfully, Alyssa Milano as Lady Godiva? This man is still living in the 11th century. He wants women to be barefoot and pregnant and stay at home. He thinks we should be ashamed of breastfeeding. The most natural thing in the world. Well, shame on him. I'm not ashamed, and neither should you be. This is not how the world works! Arrest her for public indecency and call it a day! Can she be fired? How is this not news that the world's most famous advice columnist suddenly went crazy and rode naked on a horse? I'm an advice columnist. I'm not some playmate. The episode begins with a kid in magic school accidentally summoning Lady Godiva. Naked woman! What are they going to do? Attack her? These kids don't need guidance, they need to be arrested. And you know, the legend about her riding naked on a horse may or may not be true, but she was a real person, meaning that this kid pulled off time travel in a throwaway line. Check it out, I just cast an awesome spell. Ah well, it's not like time travel is a huge deal or anything. It was only the entire plot of last season. Would it be cheating too much if I peeked ahead to see what becomes of me? Well, seeing as you're probably not going to remember any of this, I don't see why not. Why would she forget? Wasn't that the whole point of not wanting to change history because she came there? 
Are they saying that time travel causes memory loss? Because they don't alter her memory before they send her back. A time for everything and everything in place. Return what's been moved through time and space. That's the same spell they used in Season 1 to travel back from the 70s. Except that was a power of three spell, and they were only able to get back because of their mom and their younger selves. So we know that they at least remembered enough of that episode to repeat the exact same spell, but not the whole reason it worked. But hey, look, sometimes it's not the means, but the final result that matters. They needed a reason for Lady Godiva to be there. Why, you ask? Because this gives them another opportunity to focus on feminism. Girl power! When the girls send Lady Godiva back, she's had a demon piggybacking on her that's more powerful now, and thus doesn't let her finish her ride, all leading to history being changed and sending women back to medieval times, much like the show does on a weekly basis. Apparently Lady Godiva was huge for women's rights? Somehow those taxes were about women? Guys, you're lost in the imagery and completely ignoring why she was riding naked on a horse in the first place. This has diddly squat to do with women's rights. Look at Charm's version of a female repressed society. What a social commentary this is. Women wear headscarves and cover themselves and, oh no, the column has become Ask Leslie and is run by a man! Dun dun dun! If men ruled the world, they'd always be wearing suits! Why is everything gray because women are repressed? Gay men are still around, right? Who's going to fashion all of the women's babushkas? The demon, who feeds on repressed emotions, feeds on Leo, who's feeling guilty as hell about the Gideon ordeal, and overdoses on power. Actually, you're gonna let him feed on you. See ya! Good luck, man! What? This actually works somehow? Check the trailer for this. Every one of their episode promos are obnoxious. Half of them just make up non-existent plot lines for reasons I'm unclear on. Next Sunday on the WB, something naked this way comes. That's Lady Godiva. And she needs help from a charmed one. Oh! Keep your clothes on, this is a family show. Nick Lachey has never seen anything like this. Phoebe is Lady Godiva. What are you wearing? Charmed, the Bear Witch Project. Next week on the WB's Big Sunday. Something naked this way comes! Even the font mocks us on this one. And they put the ending in the trailer. Guess you can miss the episode now if all you wanted to see was naked Alyssa Milano. Actually, you know, there are movies you can rent that are a lot more fulfilling and deliver in the naked Alyssa Milano department. To me, one of the funniest episodes this season is when the ugliest demon in the underworld switches bodies with Phoebe. No, really, I think that's maybe a title she earned or something. The ugliest demon in the underworld. Phoebe has become vain, self-obsessed, and is always checking herself out in the mirror, so the demon has an easy time blending in. But the best part, the part that made me laugh endlessly, is that they actually vanquish Phoebe while in the demon's body. Don't! <laughs> How could we have known? You know, she took over Phoebe's body to kill demons. It's what Phoebe does. No, not lately it isn't. Not with everything going on at work with her. Let me get this straight. Piper says she should have known it wasn't really Phoebe because she was actually fighting bad guys and not being a selfish shit. Has the show become self-aware? No one seems that broken up over the fact Phoebe is dead either. But she's brought back, whatever. She should have stayed the hag demon. God, that is so weird. Demons never attack at P3. Don't they? Don't they now? This has never happened on this show. Never. At one point, Elise puts Phoebe in charge of the paper so she can go out on a date with her second-in-command. Which I guess means Phoebe was unknowingly third-in-command of the whole frigging newspaper. What the hell kind of business hierarchy is that? Surely there's someone more qualified around than the advice columnist? And where the hell is Jason? Does he not own the paper anymore? You're not gonna call her on it? Well, I'm not gonna buy her a new Blackberry, but all the times I've bailed, who can blame her? Wow, enlightened. Yeah, she's a real saint. So she accidentally copies her own column, leading to her stating that she never recycles her own stuff. How many variations of, follow your heart, honey sugar bee child, does she give out? And how busy she's been, she's had to have written, what, six million responses by now? But Phoebe is burnt out and needs to take some more me time, because if there's one thing Phoebe hasn't focused on lately, it's herself. So maybe I should stop giving advice to people on finding love until I could figure out how to find it myself. Or know the concept. Love is celebrating two birthdays, right? 
Elise has successfully been replaced by one of Phoebe's Egotron 3000 robots at this point, so she says she'll hire a ghostwriter while Phoebe takes whatever personal time she needs. This ghostwriter is Leslie St. Clair, played by Nick Lachey from 98 Degrees, so you know this stunt casting will stand the test of time. Phoebe doesn't like him because he's... Dun dun dun! A man! Men don't know about feelings or shit like that. Only I, the great Phoebe one, would know about it. He installed a basketball hoop in her office, that son of a bitch. Now we have yet another cycle of misandry from our lovable Phoebe, who takes as many opportunities as she can to point out how men compare to the dog poo she's recently stepped in. It's bad writing regardless, but it at least made more sense when the character she was talking about was a walking sexist stereotype. Here, Leslie isn't really doing anything to give me any sort of impression at all, much less that he doesn't get women. And that's not how it's played, either. It really is supposed to be that Phoebe is a sexist asshole. And you don't think a man can give advice to women? Oh, uh, no, actually not as well as a woman can, no. It's impossible to understand the opposite gender, unless, of course, you're Phoebe. <laughs> I mean, it's just the most ridiculous. Have you even ever heard of a male advice columnist? I mean, I haven't. What? And then, when she wants to write a letter to her own column for the stupid breastfeeding cause she's all about, we get this exchange. Well, I don't know what you're worried about. It's not like he's gonna pick the letter anyway. It's way too feminine. I'm worried because somehow I know you're gonna find a way to make him pick it. So what? Then we hit two Neanderthals with one stone. She calls him a Neanderthal? Because he's a guy? Huh? Might possibly be the worst idea I've ever had. <laughs> the worst idea you've ever had? I don't know, Phoebe. You chose to be evil queen of the underworld. Also, you wore that hideous flamenco shirt a couple seasons ago. I'd probably rank those a bit higher on your worst idea list. But eventually she gives in and admits that maybe, just maybe, he can do the job. There was some good advice in there, considering you're a guy. Oh, just fuck off, you giant sentient fart. Inexplicably, Phoebe gets some of her empathy back. But it's only for one scene, and it's never brought up again. Well, actually, I can explain it, but in the context of the story, no. Doesn't make a damn bit of sense. Doesn't she get her powers back if she does the right thing? Because all she's been doing prior to this is bitching about having a man dare to write a column in her name. But really, this is just a lame-o excuse to have her make out with Leslie at work and set up some sort of forced romantic plot for the audience to fast-forward through. Honestly, I only think Phoebe even started to like him because he appealed to her massive ego. I'm a pretty damn good kisser. Even... Though it didn't mean anything. Hmm, he complimented me. Perhaps I'll let him live. The only reason I took this gig is because I'm a huge fan of yours. Yes, good. I feed on your meaningless praise. But wait, dare he take calls from other women, even though he and Phoebe are in no way in a relationship at this point, and in fact, Phoebe has gone out of her way to treat him like herpes riddled cancer? How dare he find someone sexy other than me? I'll eviscerate him! Leslie wins a Reader's Choice Award for an article he ghost wrote for Phoebe. And she's all like, yeah, I'm hot shit. And he's like, yeah, I wrote that one. And then she doesn't know how to save face, and I laugh hysterically. <laughs> Going by the logic they used when Phoebe got the job, she did such a good job ghostwriting for that woman she got to replace her. Shouldn't she be replaced with Leslie now? Or does it only work that way when a charmed one is involved? Yeah, sorry, Phoebe. Leslie was just so good at this. And he's got a penis. I'm tough but fair. Oh no, my nightmare has become reality! Well, now that she's charmed her way into Nick Lackey's heart, he asks her on a date as a publicity stunt, which, of course, cheeses her off. Not to side with Phoebe, but he prints the article about it before asking her. That's kind of douchey. Then they have sex in the office. What an unforeseen turn of events. Why is it every time Phoebe runs away from a guy that we actually pay for it? Wait, so the only reason any of them are out fighting evil is because Phoebe wants a distraction from sleeping with Leslie? But then, Paige switches her priorities mid-episode because it's the clunkiest transition they could think of to get Phoebe to talk to him. We are not doing anything until you deal with Leslie. At this point in the story, death is non-existent and the cosmic balance is at stake. Just so you know. Boy, when you're avoiding something, you really do a number, don't you? I seem to remember someone doing some avoiding a little while back. But my big sister gave me some advice that I'm gonna give back to you. Stop dodging. Just for once, Charmed, be aware of your characters! I care about you, Phoebe. A lot. I like you too. I have this feeling that he's pulling away from me. Run, Leslie! She bathes in the blood of her exes to maintain her youth!
In another not repetitious turn of events, Leslie gets mad because Phoebe always bails on him, so they break up and we never see him again. What a good six episodes. But the story promises that this was actually to help Phoebe. It wasn't pointless, it was so that Phoebe could come to an important revelation. I couldn't give advice, especially not about love. I was just afraid. But I'm not afraid anymore. Yes, she was afraid of love, something they've never explored before. But thanks to 98 Degrees, she can go back to ignoring danger for dates. Thanks, Nick Bama. Now that Phoebe has truly learned the meaning of love, she goes around calling herself Cupid and giving the other characters unasked for love advice. Barf! Could her ego possibly be any more inflated? Just call me Cupid! Ha ha ha! Men are on the objects! The love puru, copyright me, is faced with hardship when the legal department at the paper decides she could be sued for giving bad advice. Because that's a thing. So all of her articles must be read and approved by a shrink. But just to make it easy, she makes out with him while she's possessed, and he ends up getting fired for lying. Women don't sexually harass men, it just doesn't happen. And I guess that means they won't send in anyone else, because if one guy lies, the entire legal issue is void. But this leads to Phoebe deciding to go to college again to get some more professional insight. Gee willikers! I don't know, are there courses for unwanted advice and things you pulled out of your ass? So in addition to the bullshit love advice, now she can give bullshit psychologist advice. Oh goodness gracious, great balls of shoot me. This element is really introduced to prove how smart Phoebe is. The audience must be made aware of how great she is at every possible turn, in case she was becoming unlikable or something, but I can't imagine why that would be. Look, Cosmo wants to interview her. Cosmo! Wow, they're really skimping on the photo shoots. They've got the same studio set up as the Sears portrait people Piper goes to see. Hi, I'm so sorry I'm late. It won't happen again. Of course it will. But hey, if you keep getting responses like these, who cares? It was brilliant, Phoebe. I mean it. You make us look so classy when your advice is provocative, insightful. One of the more egregious strokes of the ego in this season involves Phoebe's college professor. She asks her about child psychology because of the magical plot of the week, but the woman gets all bitchy at her because she thinks she only wants a quote for her column. I thought this was an unusual turn for the show to have someone be mean to Phoebe, but of course, that's because afterwards they have her apologize profusely and start sucking up. A minus. Yeah, the minus is to make your sudden genius at psychology more realistic. Having learned to not be afraid of love again thanks to 98 Degrees, we find Phoebe in a new situation of being afraid of love. If only someone could teach her the way. Enter Billy Zane, yet another actor much better than this show deserves. Please save us from this mediocrity, Billy Zane. Paige, still in the headmaster half of the season, is looking for a literary professor at magic school. A muse? No, 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 no. You can't hire her as the next literature professor. She'd inspire them to write novels instead of reading them. What? Enter Billy Zane as Drake, a demon who made a deal with a sorcerer to turn him human. Unfortunately for him and the audience, the spell only lasts a year and then he has to die. At the moment, he only has two weeks left to live. How long do you have? Two weeks. I can't believe it's been three weeks already. I mean, so much has happened. You had three episodes to try and keep continuity, people. Three! Speaking of which, he's hired on as the literary professor, but then later he's seen teaching about spellcasting. Good thing they didn't hire that muse for the position or she'd distract them from reading. The real purpose of Billy Zane's character is to teach Phoebe not to lose faith in love. Again, and to remind her what it's like to help people and do good. Again. You might want to send Phoebe to remedial being a fucking human being at this point. You, you've just lost faith in yourself. And you, you've been disheartened by the fight. And you, sweetheart, you are just plain mean. Okay, that was actually pretty funny. Billy Zane's part is a lot more enjoyable than it should be, but I'm sure 100% of it is the actor pulling something out of nothing. He's able to do great gestures and inflections that add layers to the character that aren't present from the writing alone. Because if you look at the fundamentals of the character, there's nothing new or innovative here compared to anything they've done over the course of seven years. Though I'll be the first to admit, sometimes the show gets a bit too caught up in putting him in funny costumes. Because costume equals funny? Piper wants to vanquish him, but Phoebe says his heart is in the right place. Hmm, this seems all too familiar somehow, but where have I seen such a scenario? Drake proceeds to woo the audience and make them wish the show was about him instead, while showing Phoebe McCantlove all around the world and sweeping her off her feet. Oh, so that's what she needed this whole time. No other guy did this for her. 
now she knows about love. You might have caught on to the fact that this is a running theme. Not in a series art kind of sense, but in a lather, rinse, repeat sense. As in, they do the same damn thing over and over again. Phoebe never evolves, and so no one cares about the outcome, which is always the same anyway. The new guy has taught her about love, and she will be brave enough to date the newest entrepreneur slash trust fund baby slash oil tycoon, which will also end in heartbreak because she lost sight of love. You know, the problem here might be rooted in the fact that Phoebe has the emotional capacity of, say, a piece of broccoli. But more importantly, who gives a flying fuck at this point? I didn't sign up for this. I wanted to watch a show about magic and sisters and terrible special effects. Instead, I've become trapped in the hellish time loop that is Phoebe Halliwell's love life. Which leads us to our moment of truth, people. If you've watched the show, you probably know where this is going. I've got to talk about the seven-year witch. Okay, okay, let me get this out of the way first. Excuse me a moment. <clears throat> comes back. This is done respectfully and fixes everything they fucked up with the character the first time around, tying everything together and giving viewers a far more satisfying conclusion. I am, of course, fucking with you. Charmed is very, very stupid, and this return is insulting, horribly written, and a waste of time. Please feel free to post your reaction videos of shock and awe. I guess this is supposed to be a big deal because this is the 150th episode, but the only special thing about it is Julian McMahon being in it. The rest is pretty run-of-the-mill for this series. It's really samey, actually, because not much happens in it. All of the elements present are recycled from previous ideas or scenarios, all of which we've seen done better in this very program. And let me be way more truthful than the advertisements for this episode ever were. Julian McMahon is just sort of sandwiched in here in what is basically a glorified cameo. And all of the scenes he has are with Piper. He never shares a single scene with Phoebe. He's never even in the same damn shot. I've heard rumors about a supposed feud between Alyssa Milano and Julian McMahon leading to the episode being shot this way, but it could have just as easily been scheduling conflicts. Regardless of what led to this, it makes his appearance in this episode just as pointless and dissatisfying. Cole's role in this whole thing is trying to get Piper and Leo back together, talking to Piper as she's dying from some sort of poison. Dead again? We learn that Cole has become stuck in the void between life and death, forced to stay there and help people for eternity as penance for his life of evil. So yes, the fact he was possessed and tried to do good amounted to Jack Diddley. Oh well! Cole tells Piper she must let go and die so that Leo will sense it and come back to her. Um, Even if they heal her body, only Leo can heal her soul. This is not how things work! Is love like an ointment now? An antidote? Can you just settle for love band-aid or something? Once Piper comes back, she doesn't give Cole any credit or tell anyone else shit about it. Thanks a lot, Cole. Now go burn in hell. You fuck waffles. The last Hallowell that trusted you ended up bearing your demonic spawn. Phoebe and I were very much in love. Yeah, that is, until she suddenly fell out of love with you rather quickly, remember? Well, maybe you should have thought of that before you decided to become the source of all things evil. Look, I already feel guilty enough, all right? This is implying either Cole forgot to mention, or the girls never learned that he was possessed at the time. To which I call bullshit! This is total retconning at this point. They have to make stuff up to make everyone else look better. But none of this is new. The part that really pisses me off, that rubs me the wrong way, is when they finally reveal Cole's true intentions. I don't want Phoebe to give up on love. No! No, 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 no! No! We're then told that Cole set up Drake with a sorcerer who made him human, and sent the demon that poisoned Piper, all so he could teach Phoebe not to give up on love. What is this? They're not making him a better character or anything, they're just setting him up to revolve around Phoebe again. And that's a lot of variables to consider. How did Cole know the elders would pull their dick amnesia stunt just as he sent those demons in to poison Piper? 
How did he know the love thing would actually work? How did he know this demon, wanted to be human, would be a genuinely nice person and be up for falling in love with Phoebe? Why did he set him up with a sorcerer that would kill him after a year when there's other, less fatal options? Why did he think Phoebe, destroyer of worlds, would be receptive to this, and why was he compelled to do such a thing? Why is part of Cole's redemption arc making sure Phoebe doesn't give up on love when, in fact, her focus on dudes has been nothing but detrimental to the fight against evil? More importantly, who gives a shit about Phoebe's love life? For fuck's sake! Really charmed. This is your stunning conclusion for Cole? He comes back to make sure evil bitch Phoebe doesn't give up on love? She treated him like crap, killed him, and blamed him for everything short of the fungus on her nasty cloven feet. Thanks for that metaphorical kick in the balls, Charmed. <sighs> I needed that. I really needed that. But seriously, fuck you, Charmed. Oh, and Drake dies and goes to demon heaven? And what the crapola is this clearly a promo shot portrait? Maybe take this on our way to preschool or what? You might be thinking right about now that the show is completely bankrupt of ideas at this point. I present to you Exhibit A, Charmed. I can't even say that without feeling embarrassed. Charmed. There's no other way of putting this. It's just Pirates of the Caribbean. Straight up. Like, not even trying to hide it. Don't believe me? Magical pirate coins. A group of pirates cursed with immortality seeking to be mortal again. Cute little animal sidekick. They do the parlay scene almost exactly. Just straight. It's not a parody, it's just lazy theft. Now, you wouldn't want to be violating parlay, would you? How would you know about parlay? Actually, I know everything about parlay. Everyone does. It's the sacredness of the captain's word. You remember Pirates of the Caribbean? Pirates? Like hot Johnny Depp pirates? If we acknowledge it's a ripoff, it's okay! <laughs> Alright, Johnny Depp turned us down. Except instead of cool pirates, we get these losers and some crusty dude with a parrot. <laughs> aye, aye, Captain! Don't you just love cliches? Young women are dying at the hands of these nasty fiends, so Piper suggests they read up on pirate lore. Phoebe says she has a better idea. What is this enlightened stroke of genius the Phoebe one has? Ask someone at the newspaper about pirate movies. Top research there, Phoebe! But good news! All of a sudden, Leslie is a pirate movie expert. Well, I grew up watching pirate movies with my dad. I got this. Captain Blood, Cutthroat Island, Blackbeard's Ghost. I mean, I've seen them all. Yes, good. Cutthroat Island is gonna be the key to their stopping supernatural evil. Not that Paige doesn't have a case of the stupids, too. She doesn't think that when she orbs out of the pirate lair, she could probably take the innocent with her. Or, you know, whatever. Now the girls have to steal a chalice for the pirates so they can drink from the Fountain of Youth. Oh yeah, they're looking for the Fountain of Youth. But don't think this episode is limited to ripping off just one thing! For reasons I still cannot explain, they throw in a scene straight from Mission Impossible into the same episode. That or someone was watching Entrapment the day before the script was due. Eh? This is so mixed up. It's like a jigsaw puzzle of genre theft. Though the museum's really up their security since the Misha Collins days. Plus they set off the alarm when she picks up the chalice anyway, so none of this actually mattered. Somehow, drinking from the Fountain of Youth breaks the spell so that when the captain is stabbed, he turns old again and dies. I'm sure this made sense at some point. Then they all turn to dust. No, not the monkey! I mean, parrot! So did you know that Grandma Ghost just now finds out that Chris is Piper's son? This is a real tight family, y'all. Help me out here. Last time I knew he was a six-foot white lighter? Yeah, that was Chris from the future. This is baby Chris now. The writers do realize things happen when the characters aren't on screen, right? So if there's like a lengthy period of time since a character was last seen, you don't actually need to make it seem like our main characters were thoughtless and neglectful. All things considered, Grandma Ghost takes this pretty well. After all, she's got more important things to worry about, like making their father feel bad about being a stupid man and putting him in his place. For instance, she tells him she knows everything about how to raise kids, such as magic being the solution over feelings. She used to cast spells on the girls all the time! How else was I gonna stop them from misbehaving? Oh gee, I don't know, by uh, talking to them? Talking? Talking's for pussies. Cast a spell, put some whiskey in their bottles, whatever will shut them up. Oh, well, we're talking about my daughter here, so I get a say in this. No. With birthdays and holidays, you get a say. With magic and demons, what I say goes. Fathers have no rights, especially when you force them out because you disagree about how to raise the children. Gosh, what a role model she is. Do you remember the first time you were this age? When I sat you and your 
sisters down and we had the talk. Not the sex talk, silly. The witch talk. Um, yeah. Writers, remember the show's premise for once. She wouldn't remember it because they didn't know about witches or magic when the show started. What are we watching at this point? Anyway, her spellcasting session to help Wyatt and Chris ends up making the girls act like little kids and fight with each other. Oh boy, we still got time for some baby voice. Wait a minute, the girls are ignoring responsibilities for their own stupid problems? What a change from the usual. You still want me to go up there for you, I can't. Yeah, nice try. Yeah, you mean the bestest column in all the world? I can't believe I just hugged you. Phoebe's acting like herself, at least. And Paige is making out with a student? Wait, how early did she get started? They're supposed to be, like, really young kids right now, right? Naturally, there's only one way to mediate between Victor and Grandma Gasly, and that's to summon in dead mom to settle the dispute. What? The last couple of times she showed up was after Prue died and to save Piper from drowning. They were kind of dire situations, you know? But now they can just summon her for what the fuck ever. Why must this show undo any great dramatic moments they ever had? It's hard to give them credit for anything in retrospect when they seem so hellbent on self-destructing. Okay, time to say some nice things. I'm not giving any credit for the lead-up here, but the moments with Victor and Patty in this episode were well done. Together they discuss everything they missed out on not being able to raise the girls, about what could have been. You do feel bad for Patty especially because she never got to experience the girls growing up. And really, after the who raised my ex-wife from the dead scenario, it was nice to see these two actually discussing important things about their relationship. Yes, this is about the girls essentially, but it is nice to see some supporting characters fleshed out in a more mature way. But enough about that! Let's talk about children! So you know how no one cares about stupid baby stuff ever? Well, I've got good news on that front! This season we have two babies! Look at that. That is the face of a child desperate for help. Maybe don't show the doll so blatantly, though. I'm not sure what's better, the episodes focusing on baby magic stuff, or the majority of episodes where they just send them to magic school to get them out of the way for the non-story of the week. Probably the magic school ones. These poor, poor kids unfortunately have Piper for a mother, and we all know how well her parenting skills turned out for them. Her blatant disregard for making sense while raising these two continues to baffle me. Take, for instance, the wickening thing. I've been told this is a real ceremony, but in Charm's own words, this is what the dealie means in this show's universe. Awakening is a blessing of goodness and light, leading a witch on the right path. I'm not sure if this is similar to, like, the window of time where a witch can be swayed to good or evil and they'll stay that way forever, but only in a relative sense. But anyway, Piper doesn't want Chris to have his wickening. Um, yes, hello. You might not remember, but the last year of your life was dedicated to making sure one of your children did not become the evil ruler of the world. I guess his wickening didn't make much of a difference there, but come on, don't jinx this or you'll have two evil dictators to overthrow in the quest for ultimate power. Although it's getting harder and harder to say no with the arrival of a new family member every five minutes. Two. Two family members came, Piper. This decision, of course, is because Piper has given up on magic. Again. What did I say? I don't want any magic. Look, I know my kids can't have a completely normal life, but I've got to give it a shot. Here's an idea. Why don't you bind their powers? But, you know, the kids are safe as long as Piper does nothing about it, allowing them to continue down their path to Darth Vader land. Here is a small list of totally not dangerous things Wyatt uses his powers for this season. He orbs Chris away out of jealousy, conveniently not to a demon lair or traffic. He creates an evil copy of Leo that comes to life from his dreams. He shrinks Piper and Leo and traps them in a dollhouse. And he creates demons out of thin air because he doesn't want to go to preschool. By the way, Piper sends him to preschool. You know, the place they didn't want exposed to magic and the whole reason magic school is written into the plot. Except for, you know, the Harry Potter thing. Orbing all over town is not normal. He's not orbing all over town. Not yet. Except when he did. Can someone please get hit by a semi now? For some reason, the entirety of season six didn't seem like enough time to explore the issue of Wyatt's morality, and the writers wanted to undermine Leo's sacrifice at the end, so we get a watered-down version of the story in imaginary themes. A demon poses as Wyatt's imaginary friend so he can lure him to the dark side. Currently, good Wyatt is summoned from the future. Oh man, this family reunion sure got awkward. Oh hi, honey. Ruling the world and killing millions of people yet? How did you become such an optimist? From you, Mom. Uh, you, alright? 
I learned it by watching you. Wyatt acts like he doesn't know what happened when he was evil. We don't want to know anything about the future. We don't want to risk changing it again. Again? But then he does, which is even more confusing. You don't have any idea how much we've already been through just to make sure that you turn out okay. Oh, I know exactly what you went through. In any other show, this would be a big deal. Piper is seeing the man Wyatt became because of Leo's sacrifice, and logically, Wyatt would have no idea about any of this. There is a light that came out of this very dark period. But, you know, the show feels like this should be treated comically. <laughs> look at Leo. He didn't think he'd be seeing him today. Well, she said that he probably was talking to an imaginary friend. I mean, not... Not y you, you know, the, the other you when you were... This is gonna be so confusing. Yeah, if you're an idiot, I guess. By the way, sending Wyatt back in time was completely accidental. Piper just wanted to communicate with baby Wyatt. Time travel is just easy now. Well, if there's one thing you guys taught me, magic may work in mysterious ways, but it always works. Except for all those spells that go wrong every week. Older Wyatt then switches from good to evil when the demon succeeds in turning him. Oh no, now he has stupid fake facial hair! Even the folks on Hercules the Legendary Journeys are like, Whoa man, that is so fake. Why would he be good in the future if this guy turned him evil the whole time? It doesn't just switch around all willy-nilly. He proceeds to ham it up doing his evil King of England shtick. You know, it's really kind of sad when a show starts doing filler episodes that are just condensed versions of the previous season's overarching story. One thing I don't understand, though, is why do you hold yourselves up in this dank lair? It's so depressing. I live in a much more upscale lair! This crying takes time. And there's the vanquishing potion. We'll keep my aunts busy for at least an hour. Or less than a minute from this line. Look, I never said I was good at math, alright? Since this episode is of no consequence to the rest of the season, Wyatt does return to the side of good? and goes back to his own time, saying his Wizard of Oz goodbyes in the process. And Mom, I think I'll miss you least of all. Yo-ho, hello! Did you just call me a ho? Yeah, yeah, Brody, fires, hunches, I got my own problems. Can't you ask her to marry you on another night? Get off that phone. You know what? I'll handle it. Good luck. I hope she says no. Well, that's the last time I call 911. Gosh, being a charmed one and caring about innocence is hard work. I'm glad we can sympathize with the plight of these women, these brave souls, these self-sacrificial martyrs to righteousness. I feel bad for how much I've reamed them now, because the story has come full circle. And by that, I mean it fell downward at the speed of light and hit a plateau at the no-fucks-given point. Kudos to all of you who watched this show in real time. You're braver folks than I. Here's a particularly good example of the shit I'm talking about. Paige casts a protection spell on a man targeted by a demon that ends up rendering him unable to die, which, of course, is taken in a comedic direction. Haha, <laughs> the gaping hole in the middle of his body is hilarious! This might be a humorous situation if the girls weren't at fault and then completely insensitive to the guy's plight. Can't have him running around San Francisco like that with Agent Brody snooping around. And you would be? I'm the angel of death. Wow, that was... overly dramatic. Dude, guys, we've already met him. Anyway, we discover that if people don't die in the order they are on death's list, the cosmic balance will be thrown off. The girls must put aside their lack of feelings and learn that death is an important part of life, a storyline we've already seen regurgitated on this show. But this time, it's Piper! Eh? Eh? Damage? We've done more than almost anyone to protect your grand design. So what if we stop people from dying? We're more important than you. You're just the angel of death. Leo, somehow this is your fault. Piper is being a complete fuckwit, so because she taunts death, he kills her and makes her do his job for a while. <laughs> oh man, oh god, oh man. Piper actually pissed off death so much that he killed her, and then she becomes death herself. It's like the show answered my prayers. Well, I think you might actually be, you know, dead. I know. Bummer, huh? Connection to other human beings complete! What about the cleaners? No, they won't help. Not after last time. What? Since when? So they just gave up because Piper bitched at them? Wasn't one of their parting lines all ominous and warning? We'll leave him in your care. For now. I love how Leo is the throw the plot hole under the rug with one line guy. Nah, the elders made it happen. Nah, it couldn't be because of last time. See, due to the rule of plot convenience, that won't be an issue. I have a ginormous beef with the logic in this episode. If death has to kill people in the order on his list or the cosmic balance will be thrown off, then wouldn't that mean killing Piper to clean it up would mess up the order and throw the balance off? Paige dies because names can be added or taken from the list when circumstances change. 
which would make that whole order thing not mean anything. Wouldn't casting the protection spell on the dude at the beginning mean circumstances changed? They kill the bad guy of the week and say they added a new soul that isn't on the list, which they can trade for pages since she was killed in the crossfire. But she wasn't on the list either. She was added because the circumstances changed. So wouldn't the same thing happen with him? And even if that made any sort of damn sense, how would replacing her soul with him restore the cosmic balance? Wouldn't it just be out of order again? I'm so confused! And then the Angel of Death bitch slaps him into the afterlife. Fantastic. It seems like Prue's episode was really the only one that got the message right. That death is inevitable and necessary. In Phoebe's version, of course, it's all about her. And in Piper's version, it's the direct opposite. You can't cheat death unless you know about the list, in which case you can totally cheat death. It's kill or be killed, I say. <laughs> so when I said Leo and Piper got divorced last season, I unintentionally lied. It turns out they talked about signing papers and making the divorce official, but then they just forgot about it once the episode ended. Whoops! It's hard to keep track of everything they don't follow through on. Sorry, dudes. Whereas I was wrong on the Phoebe front, there does seem to be a conscious effort to make Piper less of a hag this season. A lot of this has to do with Leo's storyline, which was more interesting than what they were doing with the girls anyway. After the end of last season, Leo is a bit lost, so Piper is trying to support him and lead him on the right path. Which, you know, considering his guide might be straight toward a pit of spikes, but the thought is there. She shows true human emotion here as he struggles to find his way again, worrying about his future and the future of their family. She makes him promise that if anything happens to her, he'll be there to take care of their kids. This is not just about you. You are a father and somebody's husband, too. It's worth noting, though, that there's still a bit of sinisterness lying beneath the surface. Leo kills another elder this season, and Piper covers for him. In any other show, these layers would be worth exploring, but in Charmed Land, everything is makes it easy. And Piper's new supportive role is as consistent as anything on this show. What are you smiling at? Nothing. Piper's way of working through her repression issues is to repeatedly blow Leo up. So there's that. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Leo is really searching himself this season. He's so racked with guilt in the beginning that he's spending all of his time hunting Barbus down, blinded by his own rage over future Chris's death. He's so overcome with guilt he's forgotten how to shower and has been covered with smudges from Piper's secret chocolate stash. You know those were for my sex in the city nights, Leo. Uh oh. <laughs> Could you please not do that around the children? You should just let the demons try to kill us, idiot! The elders, true to form as the dickbags they are, won't let Leo back into White Lighter Land since he killed Gideon. So why is he still an elder? Or a White Lighter, for that matter. In addition to that, they want Leo to stop hunting Barbus for revenge. Remember how the Council of Tools made up of elders and demons set Barbus free? Meaning they kind of helped Gideon out in this whole thing? No due punishment needed there? Understandably, Leo doesn't trust White Lighters anymore, egged on by Barbus's influence. James Avery, fuck, what are you doing here? Don't you have, like, Will Smith or the Turtles or something respectable to be getting to? Oh no, Leo's arm is being eaten by the green screen! Thanks to Barbus, Leo thinks the elders are after his children and ends up killing James Avery. This will go down with a stint on Beauty and the Beast as things we quickly forgot about. The hell are the proportions here? Did Barbus suddenly shrink, or is Leo a giant? In going after the child, we are in effect pouring salt into the still festering wounds of the father, who happens to be an elder. The charmed one's elder. Wait, so witches have specific elders now? Wasn't the whole reason Piper and Leo split up because elders couldn't have families, or he'd be too busy for them, or some other shit that hasn't come into play in over a year? And what makes elders different than the regular white lighters if they have charges too? I thought they did mostly management type stuff. So Barbus wants to kill Leo to leave the Charmed Ones unprotected, which again implies that the elders still haven't bothered to send the most powerful witches in the universe another white lighter. They couldn't find another stranger from the future who they know nothing about, doesn't have the ability to heal, and might try to kill them? And these other demons don't want to help Barbus go after the Charmed Ones because they say it's suicide. Until he mentions he wants to go after Leo and leave them unprotected. So even demons are aware that Leo is the only person who does anything worth a shit in the Halliwell household. That just gets me to you without the bodyguard. This leads to Barbus's offensively easy defeat, for really reals. We just knew our greatest desire would overcome our greatest fear. You set me up! This is how they get rid of their worst enemy? 
Their greatest desire? What, they just didn't want to live bad enough the other times around? They were quaking in their semi-stylish boots every time he showed up lately. Not to mention he helped Gideon get future Chris killed and destroyed Leo emotionally. But vanquishing him just sort of seems like an afterthought. Not that I ever bought that this guy was their worst enemy, but you set it up at least twice that he was charmed, so a little follow-through would be nice. I killed another elder. It's not your fault. You were tricked. Was I? What have I become? I'll say this. Leo's arc in the beginning of the season is fantastic. They continue the thread from the end of last season and give him a real gray area. I particularly enjoyed when he went on a vision quest guided by Chris. The image of his greatest failing is what helps him see what good he's done. His sacrifice was worth it in the end. There is still good to be done. However, there is still that matter of him accidentally killing an innocent elder and all. Well, as innocent as one of those jerks can be anyway. Piper worries about Leo being punished, so together they go on a world vacation. Look, they were in Italy, as evidenced by every stereotypical piece of clothing and accessories they could find there. Bellissimo! Patini? Patini. Shoes. No, actually, patini means skates. Also, why is Piper teaching Leo Italian when we already established that white lighters can speak whatever languages their charges speak? Could you turn that thing off? Uh, I'll get the ladder. Uh, forget it. Did Leo forget he could float? He was just talking to another white lighter who was floating, like the scene before that. And we saw him changing the fire detector via floating in season four. You know, you probably shouldn't be doing that on the open. Oh, please. Nobody's here. It's midnight. Why isn't he doing that up in White Lighter Land? Is there a reason he needed to be there? While I'm talking about powers, why do elders have the lightning thing if genetically they're pacifists? Not that we've ever seen any evidence of that. The show can't seem to remember how their calls work either. What is it, like a dog whistle now? Only you can hear it? Because this is something other people have ever heard? Piper remembers she was a White Lighter at one point, too, right? What's taking so long? He's resisting. And you can resist healing, by the way. The role the White Lighters play takes an even more confusing turn when they reveal that Guardian Angels exist. I was under the impression that that's what White Lighters were, and that's how they referred to them, but no, now everyone has their own Guardian Angel, including the sisters. So what are the White Lighters for? How many Guardian Angels do these girls need? And if Paige is a White Lighter who watches over future White Lighters, and she has a White Lighter and an Elder, does that mean three angels watch over an angel who watches over angels? Without Guardian Angels, people are accident prone. Yeah. Angels help prevent people from breaking cups? I thought that had to do with luck. Can't they call in their leprechaun pals for this? Oh, hey! Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> I see you got your angel back. The Perriers of the world are safe once more. Why'd we have to meet here? Because the bridge set is all we've got now, all right? Don't worry, guys. The elders nonsensically meet up at magic school a majority of the time anyway. Look, green screen is hard, okay? But one bad elder doesn't make us all bad. Um, yeah, about that? I believe the term he used was unspeakable wrath, the likes of which you can't even imagine. Not content with the elders being the bag of dicks they once were, this season they've been elevated to an entire city constructed of dicks. This includes all new and inconsistent punishments, such as this little doohickey. He would have had to have been recycled. Recycled like what? Recycled like plastic? No, I mean like sent back, reborn, to start the cycle of life over again. What happened to punishing them by just taking their powers away? The biggest example of dickery, though, is when they bring in Q. Wait till you get a load of this clown. We're supposed to hate him, but he's just so hilariously badly written. Much like that sentence. I've had it with you and your stupid ideas. Okay, he was under a spell that time, but it's still funny. This guy proves time and time again that you don't need brains or forethought to be an elder, you just need to have selective memories and a stubborn want to colossally fail at your job at every opportunity. For example, a seer demon has information that could potentially wipe out every upper level demon. She will give this information in exchange for being turned human, a price which, all things considered, hurts absolutely no one. In fact, it gets rid of one demon right from the get-go, meaning there is no downside to taking this offer. Q's reaction, of course, is to say they have other problems and ignore her. Thanks, Q! When this season's big bads have Leo possessed to attack the other White Lighters, Q thinks he's betrayed them again. He's even trying to make excuses once it's revealed that Leo was possessed. Why do they never believe that magic influence could be involved? This happens to our heroes every week, so surely there's some other precedent for this. 
We get possessed all the time. That's no big deal. <laughs> huh. What new power? We don't know exactly. But if it is responsible for this attack, elders could be next. And elders are more important than lowly regular white lighters. How did this schmo get to be a white lighter in the first place? Forget being a pacifist, isn't the minimum requirement doing a good deed or at least being a good person? None of the elders seem to qualify for this. They spend the whole season wanting to destroy the new big bad simply because they have a lot of power. They don't know who they are, what their purpose is. For all they know, they're actually good people. And really, all said and done, they weren't evil. The elders just don't want anyone else to have that kind of power. They want to always be in control. I realize this makes it sound like this was purposeful on the writer's part, but all I can see is an excuse for tension where there should be none. Give them a good reason at least, guys. Hey, maybe have them at odds with Leo, and then the sisters choose Leo over the White Lighters, which is essentially what they do later anyway. But they can't even follow through with that because White Lighters are the best deus ex machina they have. I've got no segue for this next bit, but the episode I'm going to talk about is truly amazing. Charmed has done a lot over eight seasons to amuse, anger, and confuse me, but truly nothing was more bizarre and baffling than Once in a Blue Moon. Yes, this is including the stupid hippie grandma ghost episode. I dub this the most WTF episode Charmed ever did. Congratulations, Charmed! This was an award well deserved. <laughs> to start things off in this cornucopia of madness, we see the girls displaying never seen before or since PMS symptoms because man oh man, PMS sure is wacky! They all have PMS at the same time too because women have their periods all at once? Aw oh man, it's that time of the month, time to put up the floodgates! Believe me, I checked. This episode was written by a couple of women. I've got just as many questions as you do. Maybe the girls have uh, a charmed one psychic menstruation connection. Yeah, that's it. Have Leo throw that one out there. While they're riding high on their period comedy routine, Piper decides this is the time to tell Phoebe and Paige that Leo killed another elder. This is when the story takes a turn into Weirdsville. He didn't disappear. He was killed. Leo killed him. Leo killed him? Nah. It, it was an accident. He didn't mean to. I mean, he was tricked. You might want to tell that to Zola. What the shit is this? Does PMS make them the biggest bitches in the world? I want to know what led to the decision to play it off this way, because Leo killing an elder is not funny in the slightest. Our main characters are hugely unlikable here, even more blatantly than normal. They're actually kind of evil. We're sorry. It's just, we're not big fans of the elders right now. So murdering them is okay? Even if they didn't give a shit about the elders, wouldn't they at least be concerned for Leo if he'll get caught or where he's at emotionally? It's not like Leo could really hurt anybody anyway. We don't believe that he could actually do that. Um, but yeah, he did. She just told you. Sorry to interrupt, but I have to tell you something that you're probably not gonna like. Do you kill anybody else? Yeah, good one, Chuckles. Once the audience has picked their jaws up off the floor, Paige and Phoebe complain that they don't want Leo to move back in because he's hearing voices and acting crazy. They could probably use the fact that he killed an elder as the more pressing issue, but, you know, I guess that's not a big deal to them. But what about the boys? What about them? Well, aren't you afraid they'll be in danger? From who, Leo? That's ridiculous. No, not from Leo. Who's ever after Leo? So wouldn't they be in danger because of you guys all the time? If that's your logic, you might as well just give the kids up for adoption. Anyway, the girls are given a new white lighter, which was really a shock to me, but since he's attacked by a werewolf thing, I guess they don't send backup. How badly did they need a white lighter anyway? After the attack, Hugh assumes that Leo did it. How do you know a dark lighter didn't do that? Does it look like a dark lighter did that? So a dark lighter wouldn't leave animal-like wounds, but Leo would? This makes about as much sense as Piper's theory. Maybe the elders are setting you up. I know the elders are dicks, but what? They tried to kill another white lighter to prove Leo killed another white lighter? Plus, they were supposed to be the new dude's charges. Wouldn't it be obvious that the Charmed One's white lighter might have some enemies? The only thing that attacks a white lighter is a dark lighter, that's it. Except every other thing that's thrown, punched, beat up, or called Leo a sissy? The show has been running for almost a decade now, people. They call in another white lighter as Bait, who bitches because genetically he's a pacifist, and we discover the true culprits. Because there were two blue moons that year, the girls have become PMS werewolves. PMS werewolves. PMS werewolves! Our protagonists are PMS werewolves. L-O-freakin-L. 
That is some of the worst CGI I've ever seen. Truly atrocious. I had to reboot my brain after this. The utter lack of caring over the writing, the logic, the main characters, the moral implications, every single detail is astounding. So yes, the Charmed Ones have mauled and nearly killed two White Lighters this episode. Uh-oh, SpaghettiOs! And why can't the other White Lighters heal them? Are they not able to heal PMS werewolf attacks? Well, it's a good thing the girls' clothes magically appear back on them after they turn back. I can't do that now because I have to go meet Leslie for breakfast. Sure, maul him. I don't care at this point. I'm just saying, we don't know how long we're going to be in here. What if I get hungry? Well, then we'll have Leo throw us a white lighter. Don't worry about it. You turds. It turns out, because of their animosity for the white lighters, they've been attacking them once their PMS sides took over. Look at Q's face here. PMS werewolves, oh boy! Wait, so they knock them out and just leave them where they landed all night? They didn't bother putting them in a trap or orbing them somewhere where they can't hurt anyone? And how hard did they get knocked out anyway? Did they suffer brain damage? Maybe not leave them on the couch with their necks all sideways or whatever. And what the hell was the blue moon thing anyway? They never explain it. They briefly mention that two blue moons in a year happens every 50 years, but in real life, a blue moon's not literally like a blue moon. It's just two full moons in a month. And that happens every two and a half years. So what in the blue fuck does this have to do with PMS werewolves? We don't even have any bullshit to go by this episode. We're provided with nothing. I can't, Charmed. I just can't. Alongside the CGI wolves, here's some more for the terrible effect highlight reel. We've got Terminator 2 Leo Head in a cauldron, the floaty big bad heads with lightning eyes, this flying mirror effect, and Tiny Piper. Take it all in. But let's discuss the true star of the series, Daryl. This is his last season, folks, so appreciate what you have left. We've gone on a truly amazing journey. Carol is I don't want to knowing all season. And I don't want to know. You don't want to know. See? Not that that stops the girls from being all self-righteous about it. You're gonna have to choose a side, Daryl. It's just the way it works. One bad experience with magic can't outweigh six years of good. Can it? One bad experience? Hey, Phoebe, remember that time you and Paige killed him to borrow his soul without permission? I think Daryl's probably got a solid case for himself here. Well, what about Morris? I'm sure he can ask missing persons. Ooh, ouch. They downgraded him to Morris. Guess he wasn't that important to them. Wait, well, you got something you want to say, Morris? Oh, man. Daryl has made it a point to not get involved when the girls are in danger, but when a friend of his is in trouble, he comes to them. So it's all right if he comes to them with magical problems, but not the reverse? Not that I'm siding with the girls here, but you can't have it both ways, Morris. But because it makes it easy, and they didn't want to do much with Daryl, he just ends up ignoring his crusade most of the time and helping the girls anyway. Most of his stuff this season involves Inspector Sheridan, who returns to have no point. Essentially, she's repeating her same spiel about wanting to find out who the sisters really are. She has some legitimate questions, but none of this story really comes to fruition. Who was Chris? How did he break out of jail? Why didn't they have a funeral? Or why did his body disappear? And wait, why didn't the girls get arrested if someone was murdered and their body disappeared? Why did nothing come of that? She knows we got history. And you think if she exposes us, she's not going to bust you too? Coming, Lieutenant? She was like five feet away. How did she not hear that? She gets Daryl involved with one of her stakeouts, and Piper has to distract her while Paige goes looking for some missing witches. Why didn't Paige just teleport out of the house? Well, this certainly was contrived. The Hollowells are really good people. <laughs> They do good things. <laughs> Police! Freeze! Hands in the air! What the hell is wrong with you? I'm disappointed in you, young man. Look, just because the girls didn't show up for questioning doesn't mean you could run in with a gun pointed at them. They'd have to be armed and give you a reason to have the gun out. Sheridan really is a crappy cop. Her only job is to come in and get knocked out anyway. Like, after the gun situation, she forgets what happened after she was knocked out. Did they use the memory dust on her? Because I thought they were in the shit with the elders, and memory dust was only used in dire situations. Or maybe it was the cleaners. 
And what about the cleaners? Wouldn't the Chris thing fall under their jurisdiction? Eventually, Sheridan is about to catch the girls when she's trained by Agent Kyle Brody, who ends up putting her into a coma and transferring her to a mental institution. They pulled a Mohinder on her. He lies about this for a while and says she was transferred to another department. When you think about it, he's actually more efficient than the elders are at solving these sorts of problems. Brody became involved with everything after Sheridan called in the feds. He knows about demons, witches, and more importantly, the charmed ones. Why is he telling Sheridan and Daryl about all of this in a crowded police station? He's not really good at being Agent X-Files. It seems as if he wants to expose the Charmed Ones, like every other authority type they've introduced, but in reality, he's got other motivations. Like Sheridan before him, he enlists Daryl's help in getting at the Halliwells. Poor Daryl, forever a pawn in someone else's scheme. And as soon as they know that I know that they're magical, and that I'm not a threat to them, they're gonna have to help me. So unless you want to get transferred like your buddy Sheridan, I suggest you help me. Okay, then why doesn't he just go up to the girls and say it? What's Daryl gonna do? This is after he helped them get away from Sheridan during the Pirates of the Ripoff off Bean episode, so shouldn't they already know that he knows what they know? And why would they have to help him? They've blown off universe-destroying shit. You really gonna depend on these goons having any sense of self-preservation? Yeah, we could stop you from exposing us, or I could watch supermarket sweeps! After Piper's spring break blowout as the Angel of Death, Brody catches her coming back to life and makes a deal with them. In exchange for their help later down the line, he'll say Piper faked her death to help solve some murders that were going on at the time. No one wondered why a club owner needed to be brought in by the FBI to help solve a set of murders? Your sister owns a nightclub, but she also moonlights as a government agent? Oh, okay, so the astute 98 degrees noticed and no one else. Splendid. Did they even solve the murders anyway? The audience knows because we saw the episode, but did the police even find out? She faked her death to solve the murders they didn't solve? Whoa. Guess the secret's out. He saw Piper rise from the dead. I think the secret's well out of the bag, Paige. The girls don't trust Brody, given his shadiness and penis having, but he's eager to prove that he's on their side. Well, I assume the book won't let anything evil touch it. Most magical tomes don't. All of them? Since when? Even the actually evil ones? Brody wins over Paige first, leading to a romantic relationship between the two of them. As with all of Paige's romances, it's more interesting than anything going on with the other two, and therefore short-lived. But we do get fun episodes, such as when the two of them are transported into a 1930s pulp novel. It was fun not only because things not involving mundane house stuff were involved, but also because you could tell the actors were having a great time, particularly Rose McGowan, who loves that time period. But as usual, Cupid's gotta get involved. I knew she should not have gotten him involved in this. This was a bad idea. I'm sure it's his fault. Stupid testicle mongers with their article stealing and dreamer ways. Yeah, thanks for your insight, Phoebe. Maybe your sister should just join a convent and swear off all men since they don't pass the Phoebe test. Okay, okay, okay. Brody is not that trustworthy. Let's be fair here. But Phoebe is still the most hypocritical person on the planet. She can't even stand people calling him Kyle instead of Brody because she deemed him unworthy of first name status. Hey, at least he's not calling him Kyle. Know what I mean? <laughs> I'll decide what you get to call people. Yeah, see, breakfast is not a date. Only I can go on breakfast dates. Brody may be shady, but he has helped save people, which means he's probably worth at least keeping around. Of course, it appears Piper's been rubbing off on Paige because she gets all crabby when Brody is focusing on the newest big bads instead of their dates. Therefore, he's got to make it up to her because apparently his job or the world do not take precedence over spaghetti dinner. Holy hell! How many fucking candles did he light? I might be complaining about the girls, but Brody is a far from flawless character. There's the aforementioned coma thing, as well as various other means he uses to get what he wants, including drinking Paige, minus the coma part. His mission is more important to him than his relationship. He might be slightly reprehensible, but again, he's got his priorities sorted way better than any of the main characters. And introducing him as a morally ambiguous character is all fine and good, but things get a little muddled for our supposed heroines along the way. Paige finds out about what happened to Sheridan and not only decides not to tell her sisters about it, but she's actually perfectly okay with it. So it's all right to render an innocent woman a vegetable and imprison her against her will if she's getting in the Charmed One's way? That's just evil, guys. I mean, yeah, Brody promises he'll take her out of her coma once the threat is over, but that doesn't really help. So what is Brody's end goal anyway? 
Well, his story is tied in with this season's kind of big bads, the Avatars. I'll explain them in a sec, but if you're anything like me, I know you're grateful that this was before the James Cameron thing, otherwise they'd be fighting big-breasted blue chicks or something. Brody thinks the Avatars killed his parents, so he became a cop to find out what happened. Eventually, he's able to go back in time to the day his parents died, and he finds out that it was actually demons who wanted a set of potions that could kill the Avatars. Once they do a speechy speech about why they're there for the audience and for Kyle, they disappear without taking anything. Why didn't they take the non-broken potions with them? Because the remaining potion Brody has in the present was taken by the Avatars, he steals it from the past. Wouldn't that mean he never had it as a kid and thus never found out about the Avatars? Please stop doing time travel, Charmed. So who are these Avatars, raising a big stink with the white dickers and demons alike? Well, they were in power during ancient times until something happened and they went away, but now they're back to continue what they were doing. They have a lot of power, as the show likes to remind us. We've detected a power surge, a time shift that could only mean one thing. The Avatars are making their move. How do you know it's them? Because no demon has this kind of power, not since the Source. The Source never had time control powers. He got Tempest to do his work for him. And while we're mentioning Tempest, yeah, he's a demon with time control powers. And remember how Cole could time travel? Or how about this? The elders totally had the power to send someone back in time. They gave the girls a one-time-only spell when they went to the future in Season 2. And the cleaners, they could also rewrite time. And Grandma Ghost with her go-go boots. Plus there was all of Season 6, and oh yeah, that one kid in magic school who summoned Lady Godiva. At this point, the audience can time travel. To make things seem a little more exciting than years past, the Avatars are set up as this big flippin' deal. All season, everyone is talking about a rising power, hinting at things in ominous, vague manners and whispering with big, googly eyes. What could they possibly be, these big, floaty heads that spout lies and zoom amusingly across the screen? And there are the Avatars, who we've already seen and subsequently forgotten about way back in Season 5. They were setting up a plot between them and Cole, but since he went bye-bye, the storyline was nixed. But Charm's number one motto has always been recycle, recycle, recycle. So the avatars are back and the storyline is on again, minus Cole. But I'm sure Phoebe's still gonna blame this one on him. But here's the problem with treating the avatars like some mysterious looming big bad. If you were paying any attention at all to their dialogue with Cole, you already know their end goal. It's like, you know, when you rewatch The Sixth Sense, the ending doesn't really have the same impact because you already saw it. Except in this scenario, imagine The Sixth Sense starts with Bruce Willis finding out he's dead. So what do the Avatars want? Neutrality. The abolishing of good and evil to create a utopia where neither exists. Their plan of luring anyone with power to the side of neutral is kind of dumb, though, because no one actually switches sides, as evidenced when Cole became an Avatar and used his powers for evil. Then he undid his becoming an Avatar by changing the timeline and made the whole thing a giant waste of time for them. And if Cole could use his Avatar powers to undo something that happened, then why couldn't the Avatars use this to their advantage any time this season? And though the end goal is the same, the Avatars now don't really connect with the Avatars then. When Cole kills the bar guys, they go, yes, welcome, like turning evil helped them somehow? Control is the first discipline of an avatar. Otherwise, our powers can become dangerous. Ah, so that's why they wanted to recruit Cole after he killed a bunch of guys in a bar. When they show up again this season, at first they float around as demon heads, commanding Leo to do things and driving him crazy. They tell him to go after Barbus, and in turn tell Barbus to go after Chris, a move which I'm still trying to place in their grand plan. This makes no sense with their motivations. What do you want? What do we want? We want. We want. We want. You. What a tempting offer to neutrality. I still think a direct approach is best. How is flying around as stupid, vague, big heads a direct approach? Isn't sneaking around the opposite of direct? This isn't just limited to head games. They also have Leo possessed, so he'll attack the elders and drive them further away from him. But when he finds out it was them all along, he's not that bothered by it. Because if they're so powerful, wouldn't they have attacked by now? Uh, sending a demon to possess you doesn't count? Still, I think that was their way of communicating with me. And those floating heads that tormented you, they made your life better? That was just a way to get my attention. Make me open to a new idea. Yeah, just their way of getting your attention, by having you betray anyone you've ever trusted and almost getting you killed. What pals? There's also the time they tried to trick Leo into believing everyone is dead in the future. 
Why is Paige on the Halliwell tombstone? Her last name is Matthews. Well, fuck her adoptive family, I guess. And wait, they had the White Lighter Land set this whole time? Then why the bridge or magic school? Charmed. And of course, there's more frivolous main character deaths, so Leo has to become an avatar to bring them back. Aw, you brought Phoebe back too? Don't do us any favors, Leo. Hey, if the avatars could raise anyone from the dead, why wouldn't they raise other powerful people they needed to sway to their side? Why couldn't Leo raise the elder he killed back from the dead? Leo is down with the Avatar's vision of the future, but he has to hide his powers from the sisters for a while. So instead, he focuses on trying to win Piper back, forgetting she is a ghoul who digs up graves to feast on human flesh and is therefore uninterested in men other than to procreate. But now that Leo isn't crazy and his life is back on track, Piper doesn't want to see him. I only want the opposite of what he wants, okay? What's the point if I don't get Piper back? Did they only go so far as to change Cole to Leo in the script? There is some excuse as to why the Avatars don't use their powers that much, because as a collective, their powers are connected. Meaning, if someone does something big, it drains them all. It seems like they're wasting their powers on things that are kind of stupid instead of the more useful things I've mentioned, but what do I know? Leo decides to tell the girls that he's an Avatar, and they immediately tell Brody, even after Phoebe made this huge deal about not trusting him. Hmm, do I want to focus on my hatred of Paige's boyfriends, or do I want to be a complete idiot? Idiot wins! They know Brody has this huge vendetta with the Avatars, and they know he's desperate enough to make Sheridan disappear to get her out of the way, so they didn't think telling him would lead to bad consequences. Leo ends up almost being killed, but the Avatars turn back time to save him. Why didn't they do this to save Cole after his stupid plan to get back Phoebe? He had pretty much limitless power already, so wouldn't he be useful to keep around? Plus him dying hurt the Collective, so that's a double whammy of things they don't need. So now the girls don't know again. It was worth it draining the Collective's power to show Leo what a bad idea it was to tell them, the conclusion being that the sisters must find out on their own terms. So in the very next episode, he just tells them anyway. But hey, at least it'll happen differently this time. Except no, it doesn't. Paige tells Brody, and he tries to kill Leo again. Time Waster! The Series! In order to get the girls on the Avatar train, the Avatars ask Leo to protect the Seer, because the writers forgot we already had a character called the Seer, in a very important role, I might add, and they can't come up with any more generic names. Hey, it's Charisma Carpenter! Can we be Buffy now? Have you thought of a name for yourself? Oh, it's Kira. It always has been. It's just everyone calls me, uh, the Seer. <laughs> Explained away in the twilight hour. Thank god that was resolved. Maybe don't give her the most obvious double in the world, or perhaps give her a fake midriff that actually matches her skin tone, huh? So Leo has to protect her, and she says she has information that could wipe out all of the upper-level demons. That surly one? It's your wife? <laughs> Kira, in return for her information, wants to be turned human. Why would a demon want to become human? Well, because apparently living in hell kind of sucks, then why are there demons that live on the surface? And she wants to feel good things, too. Which is sad, because they're my family. Well, I mean, it would be sad if I had feelings. Demons don't have feelings. Demons don't have feelings! Not only that, but they're telling us they literally have no sense of touch. Oh, come on, take off your shoes. Let me feel the grass through you. Then how do they feel pain or anything? What? I know, I wouldn't actually have a soul, but I could live with that. Then what goes to the Graboid afterlife to get taken to hell? Cole was half human, yeah, but there were other demons there. That's how he absorbed their powers to get out. Plus, the source came with him, and he was a demon. Every single thing about the Seer character is a contradiction to previous facts or a giant question mark. So Phoebe starts to care about her because they're like vision buddies now. It figures she'd make a connection with someone who doesn't have feelings. Why does she only give a shit about someone in danger if it's a demon? Man, if only Cole had been a seer too. He and Phoebe could have had some psychic connection and she wouldn't have been such a twerp. Kira sees her own death and Phoebe wants to save her, but they're too late. Makes it easy! Oh well, at least the earrings she borrowed from Phoebe are alright. I did like that, along with Drake's story, they did try to present a less black and white view of good and evil with Kira, but the story's not really about that, hence why they just blew her up in the end. The real reason for this connection is so that Kira can show Phoebe a vision of the future once the Avatars have taken over. Phoebe sees Utopia and convinces Paige and Piper to join the Avatar side too. She even shows her vision to Q, and his heart grew three sizes that day. I can't wait for that to go somewhere! Spoiler alert, it doesn't. Once the Elders find out Leo has become an Avatar, they immediately try to blow his ass away. 
Looks like some people aren't getting Christmas cards this year. I was trying to create a better world for them, for all of us. Too bad you failed. Ooh, somebody turned up the sesameter. Thus begins the bizarro mid-season season finale two-parter. It'll make sense in a minute. We start with Extreme Makeover World Edition. Seriously? With that title? Seriously? I just... The avatars have enlisted the Charmed One's help in creating a spell that'll put everyone to sleep and set them back to default mode, thus wiping out good and evil. Somehow this seemed like it would work. Also, Leo finally gets his sweet avatar robe. He's moving up in the fashion world. Okay, for real, if you had the choice between faux velvet lame weenie robes and the all-black avatar ensemble, I'd pick the avatars too. So the girls are preparing for this wipeout, unsure but optimistic about what this will mean for the world. But most importantly, what it'll mean for them. Will you give me a lift? I want to make sure I get my last column in. Last column? Well, yeah. How much advice can a world with no conflict need? Yeah, that's the most important thing right now, Phoebe. Keep on keeping on. And isn't your column about love advice? I guess this utopia won't involve love in Phoebe's mind. Then the logic gets even less logical. When the people of the world are put to sleep, this won't affect the demons, leaving them exposed so the sisters can wipe them out before they fall asleep too. So it's not so much getting rid of good and evil as just getting rid of good? Look at this guy gently setting his coffee cup down. Thank God the lattes of the world will be safe in the transition. But really, no one sees a problem with putting everyone in the world except demons to sleep? Isn't that advantages to the demons? Now there is no good and only evil. Plus they can just pretend to be asleep too until the whole thing blows over. Why don't they just leave? To where? Space? The group splits up to kill off whatever demons they can find. Why does Leo go alone with Phoebe? What's she gonna do? Give them love advice? And why split the sisters up? Wouldn't they need the power of three? But get this, not only are the Zero sisters tasked with finding and killing every demon in the world, but they're only given two hours to do it. They realize they can't walk around the world in two hours, right? While this is going on, Brody, the only smart person left, teams up with Zanku, a powerful demon who becomes more prominent later in the season. With Zanku's help, Brody doesn't fall asleep and get a slate wiped, allowing him to use his potion to kill one of the avatars. Unfortunately for him, he gets killed in the process, but he does weaken the collective. Because of this goof-up, the avatars put the girls to sleep early, so instead of having two hours to kill demons, they had, I don't know, 15 minutes. Close enough! Part of why the girls agreed to do this, though, was being able to choose when their slates were wiped, because free will only matters if you're a charmed one. Now the world is perfect and conflict-free, and no one questions much. And if they do create conflict, the avatars simply destroy them. Makes it easy! Wait, so why did the girls have to go around killing demons when the avatars can just poof them away now? And ignoring grief, false happiness, punishing negativity... Isn't this just the ending of last season? Like, exactly? Except it has to ignore what it's set up to work. People aren't really neutral if they're causing conflict, which means the spell didn't mean anything. And the avatars aren't neutral either because they're destroying people. The problem is, the avatars aren't neutral beings. What they're promising is paradise, a perfect world, which would be dominated by good. True neutrality would be the absence of anything. The writers had to add this part in to have some sort of conflict. They have to make them something that, thematically, they aren't, just to make the story work. This all seems to be hinting that the avatars don't just want neutrality, that there's something they're hiding. But when everything is all said and done, no, apparently that's what they want. Things happen because it sounds mysterious or it looks cool, but it doesn't really make a whole lot of narrative sense. And the avatars present an intriguing notion. How do you fight something that isn't truly evil? Is utopia worth taking away choice? Must evil exist in order for good to exist as well? But all of this gets swept under the rug because it's easier to just have them do evil things and make the decision black and white. What if, instead, they had created a perfect world? But the takeaway is that no one has free will anymore, no sense of right or wrong, because they're simply nothing. The girls would have to make the decision to take that away from everyone, take away the absence of conflict in exchange for choice. On the other hand, they could just make the avatars blow people up. I guess that works too. Leo hasn't been wiped and he doesn't trust this new world, something which Sanku takes advantage of. He reaches out to him and they meet up in a pyramid. Get it? Because the actor was in The Mummy! Zanku tells Leo that in ancient Egypt, the avatars did the same thing they did here, and the Egyptians rose up against them, throwing them from power. Mind telling me where we are? An ancient tomb in an ancient pyramid, where no one, especially not the avatars, are gonna look for us. Of course! The old ancient pyramid trick. 
Why would the Avatars not think to look for their enemy in the place they were defeated last time? Isn't that, like, a really obvious place? Why is Leo the only Avatar that questions anything? Was he the only one who was recruited from the outside? Why wouldn't they recruit an army or something? Don't they need more power for the Collective? Or was Leo the only doofus they could convince to join them? They waited thousands of years for this? I hope the Avatars don't keep him as busy as the Elders did. Even in a conflict-free world, Piper is an idiot with no sense of priorities. Leo decides that the only way to get through to the Sisters is to purposely create conflict, causing himself to be phased out. Phoebe goes to the Book of Shadows to remember all of their losses and that they should hurt. Oh yeah, Cole's death. She was really broken up over that one. Nothing perks up a girl's career like sending her husband straight to hell. She reminds Piper that losing Leo is a bad thing, and reminds Paige that Kyle dying kind of sucked. Now they're back to normal. So they just had to remember to feel bad? That seems kind of easy. It's almost as if this utopia thing wasn't very stable in the first place. They visit our go-to team-up guy, Zanku, and tell the avatars what's what. No one is taking away their choice to love themselves over everyone else. They tell the avatars they want free will, and then... The avatars just sort of give up. Meh, we'll come back later. That's it? The avatars just needed someone to say no, and they're like, whoops, guess no one wanted this. I shit you not, this argument only lasts a minute and a half. I timed it. It took them less time to give up on their world-conquering neutrality crusade than it does to microwave popcorn. What the shitballs? So they used the rest of their power to reverse time before Utopia began, but just after Brody died, because it's more dramatically convenient and they don't have anything else to do with him. But good news! Brody is rewarded for a sacrifice by the almighty dicks themselves, and he's turned into a white lighter. Oh man, Brody, my condolences. You heard it here, folks. If you team up with a demon, attack the Charmed Ones, put an innocent woman into a coma to benefit yourself in a misguided attempt to take down someone who didn't even commit the crime you thought they did, you get to become an angel! Why did he orb off to White Lighter Land like he's still dead and leave Paige to clean up after him? And why can't they see each other again? He remembers she's half White Lighter too, right? I'll call you Paige, bye! See, I remember everything because I was unaffected by the spell, and you remember everything because you broke it. And even though time rewound, we still experienced it. Headache forming. Look, it's convenient, all right? And Leo's not an avatar anymore because that's beneficial to the collective. Fuck if I know. So yes, you're understanding this right. They just gave up on the season's arc halfway through. Like, they just got bored with it and decided to do something else. I mean, I don't know why they even bothered if this was what they were going to do with it. Not only is it half of a season, but it also feels like half of an idea. This year is really split down the middle in a lot of ways, which is why it seems like I'm jumping around a lot more this review. It's more like two mini-seasons stuffed into one. It's hard to talk about one character all at once because things shift halfway through the season once the Avatar thing is done, especially for Leo, who is all over the place. What started off really well with him seems to delve into Spike Syndrome, where they continually shift the character around to see what sticks. Now that the world is back to normal, we must re-establish that the Elders are dicks. Despite being the catalyst for the mild argument that shook the world, they decide to punish Leo for becoming an Avatar. And the Elders still need him. They aren't gonna do anything rash. I believe the term he used was unspeakable wrath, the likes of which you can't even imagine. The Elders think that Leo messed up because he couldn't decide between his life with the White Lighters and his life with the Charmed Ones. How the hell did they come to that conclusion? Isn't being the Charmed One's White Lighter intrinsically connected to the Charmed Ones? And what did choosing the Avatars have to do with his home life? Because whatever, we had this idea and we're doing it. It doesn't have to make sense. So naturally, the Elders give Leo amnesia and send him to Earth. The idea being that on his own, he must either find Piper or choose them. He'll forge his own destiny. We erased his memories and put him back on Earth as a mortal. Somewhere you'll never find him. Yes, Texas. A place they'll never find him. Guess that makes it kind of hard for him to find Piper and choose her. The point is, Leo and Piper's love, it's epic, it's massive. It's like Romeo and Juliet, Anthony and Cleopatra, Brad and Jennifer. Yes, their love is truly epic. Like all of these romances that ended in double suicides and divorce. Put a cork in it, Zane! Immediately after he's sent to Earth with amnesia, he gets flashbacks of his past, including proposing to Piper. Look, there were only two parts to this plan. Give Leo amnesia and let him figure things out on his own. And you've got both of them wrong. 
Q just shows up as a truck driver and takes Leo up to White Lighter Land with no memory, acting all evil and obvious in the process. Makes it easy! Well, la di da What a story worth telling! We are not taking away anything from you, Leo. This is about you making a choice, not us. What was the point of setting this up if that was the plan? They could have just forced him to stay a White Lighter with no memory, or just recycled him if that was the idea. There was no reason for the stupid Texas adventure other than to make the elders look like dicks. Once he remembers Piper, he's like, hey, you guys are dicks. Imagine that. I guess with no memory, anyone will choose the option you want them to. Once Leo makes his decision to be with Piper, he chooses to fall from grace and become mortal, which is literally jumping off a bridge and smashing into the asphalt, Wily Coyote style. <laughs> <laughs> hey, did you know if you're mortal and you jump off a bridge, you only scrape up your face a little bit? But why does he do this before Piper is healed? Her dying from a poison was the reason Phoebe and Paige convinced him to come back. He realizes she's dying and he's mortal now, right? But Wyatt already healed her, because he can do that now. Guess all of that was pointless, too. Now Leo has to adjust to life without powers like this is a new thing. Except for season two? It's everything I've wanted ever since the day I met you. Yeah, um, no. Except you chose to be a white lighter again in season two, and apparently had this option the whole time, except when you didn't. I just want to fit in. I just want to be one of the cool kids, too. You'll never be cool, Leo. Now be on lookout while we go smoke behind the school. Um, does this mean I'm promoted? Shut up, Daryl. Oh, man. Leo's back to Weenieville and whipping boy duty. Such is his fate. He spends most of his time cleaning and organizing, which Piper complains about because she's a ghoulish caricature of a human being. Also, everyone is vulnerable now because they still don't have a new white lighter and Leo is powerless. But maybe Wyatt can heal them. Oh, wait, that was like an episode ago. We're just supposed to sit here and do nothing while you bleed to death on the couch? What do you want me to say? I can't self-heal anymore. Without a doctor. You used to be a doctor. And as a former doctor, he knows not to put pressure on the wound and simply bleed out. Now that the first half of the season has been abandoned and squared away in the forgotten plot development corner, the focus is now on Zanku, who helped the sisters take down the avatars. Sort of. He was moral support, I guess. What's the matter, Zanku? Chicken? Zanku is a demon who was imprisoned by the Source way back in the day for being too dangerous, so you know he's this grand evil poobah. He's scary and powerful because they tell us he's scary and powerful. They were vulnerable, I sensed it. I just didn't anticipate the Elder coming to their rescue. Everyone knows about White Lighters except Zanku, I guess. Or maybe he really didn't think the Elders were that helpful, which makes him pretty smart. He wants to control the Nexus under the house and harness its power, taking over the manor to do it. Because somehow controlling the house means controlling the Nexus too? Oh no, now they're free to play with children's stuffed animals and mwahaha all around the place. Luckily for them, Piper has written a diary talking about all of their personal stuff that Zanku reads to fill him in. Well, it's a good thing that fell into the right hands. It's not like there's a police officer wanting to find any sort of evidence against them. But don't worry, at least one of our trio is the greatest of minds. Fine, but we can't use any more magic, otherwise Zanku will sense us. We can't use magic? What do you call it, Orbit? Okay, fine. Then we won't use any more magic. I have an idea. A kick to the face. What a master of strategy. As we know, the Nexus can be swayed to good or evil, which I always thought meant what was in the closest range. But apparently, it's whoever summons it, or whoever is in the house at the time, or whatever is convenient. When it's summoned by good and evil of equal power, it chooses the most neutral party present. In this case, it's Leo, who isn't really neutral and has no powers at this point. If anything, wouldn't it choose one of their neighbors or something? The Nexus is just a confusing plot point I barely got and still barely get. Way back when, there was a being called the Shadow that was trapped in the Nexus because, eh, which became the Woogie Man Phoebe was terrified of as a child, and they trapped again in a season one episode. Sorry, I didn't mention that until now. But by season seven, the Shadow has just become interchangeable with the Nexus, so who the hell knows what it is? All we really know is that it's a big important thing that the bad guys want and should not have, or else there will be danger of some sort which will result in a big deal because they tell us so. It's huge and dramatic, but hell if anyone actually knows what's at stake here. It's almost anticlimactic. Seems almost anticlimactic. Neutrality wins. Yeah, you're pretty good at this psychology stuff. You should read my column. I do. Hack, hack, barf. I'm happy we still have time for this shit.
The Nexus should have possessed Phoebe. She's the most powerful force for evil they've ever known. The ego inflation is interrupted by a demon attack. Is he okay? No. He's dead. Well, that's a relief. I thought we were gonna have to sit through another shitty Phoebe love story. As per usual, Phoebe finds as many ways as possible to make this man's death all about herself. In fact, he asked me out on a date for tomorrow night. It's just my luck, huh? Well, I mean, I know we've seen a lot of deaths, but she's taking this one particularly hard. I was just talking to her on the phone, and she thinks she's, uh, cursed. So Phoebe vows to focus again on her fight against evil, to destroy the demons that took this innocent man's life and make a difference in the world. Just kidding. She thinks maybe Sheridan exposing their magic wouldn't be so bad because they wouldn't have to deal with bad guys anymore. Somehow. This is all part of Senku's Lita Scooby-Doo scheme. He's teamed up with the Crypt Keeper. No, really, they cast him as a guy who raises the dead. They even dress him like the Crypt Keeper. And he haunts Phoebe with the ghost of a date long past. Zanku then kills one of Paige's charges, making her feel guilty for leaving her behind to help Phoebe and Piper. And they bring Inspector Davidson back from the dead to make Phoebe feel guilty about that time Prue had to let him die? What? And why did Phoebe get two guilt zombies and Piper got none? They seriously couldn't think of any instance where Piper's negligence led to someone's death? This happens like every week. That's like trying to find an item without roast beef on the Arby's menu. Those are all innocents I've lost. Oh, sorry. They gave her three random people we've never seen before. My bad. Davidson's looking pretty good for someone who's been dead for four years, though, I've gotta say. Meanwhile, Leo is sent to magic school with the kids because without powers, that's the writer's default for him. That leaves our heroes free to fight their innocent victims, who continue to guilt them, and deservedly so. Seriously, have you done any good at all? <laughs> Holy shit, yeah! This is fantastic! Hilariously, Piper just blows the innocents up to solve the situation. <laughs> In a scenario dependent on guilt, our villains never took into account that the Charmed Ones have no conscience. Well, this whole thing is very serious and treats the theme of innocence lost with much respect, just like the promo. But Phoebe's found a protector who can't protect her. You know me, busy little bee. Fresh Charmed, I slept with a zombie. All of this song and dance was in actuality a big distraction, so Zanku could steal the Book of Shadows and speed read evilly. How did he steal the Book of Shadows when evil can't touch it, you say? Because the girls felt guilty, they were weakened, and that means the book was weakened too. Because that was a thing this whole time? That seems like the weak spot on the Death Star, if you ask me. Really obvious and easily exploited. Which brings us to the season finale. Zanku tries to take control of the Nexus again, but the girls cast it out of him from magic school. From the magic school. Impossible. Nothing's impossible there! It's made of dreams and unicorns and pure imagination! So wait, the girls were able to cast that spell from magic school the whole time? Why did they even bother with the whole Leo thing before? While the girls are hiding out at magic school, they try to figure out how to get rid of Zanku, but more importantly, how to get their house back. How about a love spell? We can make them fall for one of us. Phoebe, you don't get to come up with the plans anymore. She and Piper reminisce about spells they performed over the last seven years, trying to think of one that might be able to vanquish Zanku. There are some spells they've used in the past that might be helpful. For instance, vanquishing the source of all evil. Why can't we try to vanquish Zanku the same way we vanquish the source? He'll be ready for that. That's why we need something new. Hmm, something new, eh? What if we humiliated him and turned him into an animal? Like we did that one time to everyone at P3, remember? Like that episode in Season 2! <laughs> something new! They would never do that to Zanku, though, right? He's supposed to be scarier than the source of all evil, and yeah, they totally do. Take it all in, folks. This is our terrifying villain, worse than the most evilest of the evil. If there's any other way they can make this physically painful for the audience to watch, they're gonna take it. Oh, did I mention they team up with fairy tale creatures again? Yeah, this is their epic last Harry Potter book fight, but with gnomes and fairies and leprechauns. What the hell? I know I probably shouldn't be laughing at all of them dying, but come on, this is so stupid. Oh snap, a leprechaun just killed a bitch! Yeah, see, showing your big bad swatting uselessly at a fairy is probably not the best way to close out your season. The girls try to take the book back, but it won't let them touch it because they aren't confident enough. Now that's a thing? The book doesn't let evil or unconfident people touch it? That's a stupid, stupid flaw! Zanku steals their powers over the course of the episode, so he'll be able to take the Nexus. The elders show up to help, but they only send one person, and only to magic school, and not during the battle where it actually mattered. 
Remember, they're still dicks. That might have raised the stakes a little bit, and made this battle a little more exciting. The Elders versus the Demons, but I guess Leprechauns are a good substitute. As if the Elders haven't dropped the ball enough, they've decided to take the ball, smash it through a window, and then set fire to the house, because they reveal that there was a spell to destroy the Nexus the whole time, which wasn't used because everyone is a fucking moron. There's a spell in the book, one you've never used before, called How to Banish a Suxin. A Suxin? Nexus spelled backwards. Look! It's called a spell backwards! It's a spell to banish a Suxin. I can't even form into words how absolutely asinine the show is. They say good won't be able to access the Nexus if it's destroyed, as if it's been used for good ever in this series. But you guys are the charmed ones. No one is more powerful than you guys are. Except for Wyatt, the most powerful witch ever, or ah, who cares. The sisters try to team up with the vampires for some reason, and offer them immunity if they help take down Zanku. Not only can you see this betrayal a mile away, but it serves no other purpose than padding the episode out. Season finale! The show takes another turn for the deliciously stupid when Zanku tries to get to magic school by simply flying into the ceiling. Are you guys sure he was the scariest bad guy you could think of? Are you absolutely sure? Things are clearly getting dramatic with the big bad flying comically into things, so Daryl has to finally make his choice. Will he help the sisters or choose to stay out of things to protect his family? There is nothing more important to me than you and those kids. Nothing. But if we're about building a better future for our family, then I have to help the sisters. Isn't that what they're fighting for? Emmy Award goes to Daryl! Yeah! He's selling their self-centered attempts to get their house back for all it's worth. You wonderful man, you. And I... Finally, the girls have found a formidable foe. This isn't just about the fight against good or evil, it's also about pride. And no one steals away the stupid spotlight from the Halliwells. So the girls go to their father and drop off Wyatt and Chris along with the deed to the house and P3, meaning this fight is basically a suicide mission. Gals, you turned him into a pig. There's probably an easier way. It is pretty sad to see Piper saying goodbye to her sons, even though it's likely they just come back as nagging ghosts anyway. Earlier in the season, Sheridan was brought out of her coma, something Brody did once he became a white lighter because, whoops, that's kind of a douchey thing to leave hanging. Sheridan's back. What? Oh no. I wanted her to stay a vegetable forever! Kyle used memory dust on her to make her forget what happened, but everyone has to walk on eggshells around her after that. But as long as we don't trigger her memory, we should be fine. That's how memory dust works? Man, the elders suck. Fast forward to the finale, Sheridan is back to trying to expose the girls and calls in Homeland Security. What do you know about what happened to your agent Brody? You tell me. He disappeared. I think I know who knows why. He told me to tell her that they went on some undercover mission and that he died and she wound up in a coma. Just how long do you expect her to buy that? Guess Daryl is a really bad liar. Oh, man! The same people who probably know what happened to three other cops who were either killed or mysteriously disappeared in the past seven years. Wait, 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 wait. Does that say Gordon on the front? Is in Dan Gordon? Neighbor Dan? He disappeared or died? Holy shit. Season 7 had a twist I never even saw coming. The Charmed Ones fucking killed neighbor Dan. Yes! That greasy butt crack poof flat knows too much. Now he must die. It's official. This is the greatest episode Charmed ever did. I can't top that. That's the finale. Bye, everyone. I'm done forever. Okay, fine. If you really want to know what happens, Sheridan butts in on Homeland Security's investigation, and this is what happens. Wow, what a waste of time! Thanks, two years worth of half-ass season arcs! As for the three fail skateers, they learn how to astral project as a distraction to get the book back. Because apparently, they're confident again. Well, I kind of wish we'd learned how to do it earlier. Would have come in handy. Well, Prue is really protective of it. I'm just glad she showed Leo how to do it. <coughs> Bullshit! Homeland Security and the SWAT team show up to take down whatever killed Sheridan, and Daryl tries to buy the girls some time. They let Zanku take in the Nexus and say the spell, seemingly blowing them all up. But in reality, they astral projected and faked their own deaths, taking on new identities. Maybe you shouldn't take off the glamour like 10 feet away from the SWAT team, gals, just saying. 
So far, the plan. Plan? What plan? Wait, they didn't even tell Leo? They gave up the house and everything. It's the only way to get our lives back. Our normal lives. <laughs> now we can ignore those in need. It's someone else's problem now. No more demon fighting ever again. The whole point of fighting demons wasn't to save face as the charmed ones, it was to save innocence. Well, fuck them, I guess. So we could get the next generation ready to pick up where we left off. Wait, Leo had to get a fake identity too, but not the kids? As far as anyone knows, the only ones who died were the sisters. And real fucking cute. They turned him into a dude who looks almost exactly like neighbor Dan, the greasy butt crack poo flat they killed. Oh well. And with one final nod to Daryl, our true hero, the series closes out. Yeah, the series. This was supposed to be the series finale. Kind of puts all of the stupid into a new context, doesn't it? It's not hard to figure out what this was supposed to be. The title is Something Wicca This Way Goes, a play on the pilot's title, Something Wicca This Way Comes. The episode is sprinkled with tons of references to past episodes, allowing more continuity than the show ever had in the past, as well as several references to Prue. The astral projection was obviously their nod to her character, and it's strongly implied that the door closing at the end is Prue's spirit. This was definitely closing the book on Charmed. So let me remind you, their series finale was going to include shots like this. That was really it. The Suxon spell, the fairy tale battle, the elders abandoning them. It's hilarious how inept it is. And yet, if Charmed was going to close out this way, ignoring the stupid stuff, this was probably the best we were gonna get. I actually liked the ending, believe it or not. Everyone's story is closed about as well as it could be, and the bit about teaching the next generation about magic is a good way to send them off. Hell, even Daryl got his moment at the end there. And come on, they killed off neighbor Dan. Apparently, with the next season unsure, the ending was originally written with all of them dying, but I'm not sure how true that is. The ending seems pretty final, and if this was meant to lead into a new season, they didn't do a very good job of it. We didn't need to explore things any further here, and while the show certainly went way past the point of no return, continuing after that is like beating an already tenderized dead horse. But, indeed, there is one more season. Alas, I am forever trapped in Charm's steely grip. See you in Season 8.